Hi, I am Dr. Selvaraj, Professor of Surgery, Malakka Manipal Medical College, Malaysia. Welcome back to my series of surgical teaching video class. These are meant mainly for undergraduate medical students doing the surgical clerkship rotation. In this episode, I am going to talk on non variceal upper GI hemorrhage. In the previous ep episode, I talked about the variceal upper GI hemorrhage. So, I request my viewers to watch both the videos together. So, in the last video itself, I told you the various causes for upper GI hemorrhage. Broadly, you can divide it into variceal bleeding that comprises 20% and non variceal bleeding that is 80 percent there are some uncommon causes also for upper gi bleed so the non variceal bleeding the main thing is almost uh, more than 50 percent it is because of septic ulcer disease so in this episode i am going to talk about this non variceal bleeding and the uncommon causes for upper gi hemorrhage so this is our uh, classical clinical winner our patient is a 50 year old male present to the emergency department with 3 hour history of blood vomiting or hematemesis. He has no such prior history. The vomiting was not preceded by retching. He states that the blood was bright red. He currently feels slightly dizzy. He has no history of alcohol abuse. He has not he has noted intermittent epigastric pain for the past two weeks that is relieved by taking oral antacid pills. On review of system, he notes that he injured his knee a month ago and has been taking ibuprofen daily for pain relief. On examination, the blood pressure was 100 by 60 millimeters of mercury and heart rate of 110 beats per minute. There are no signs of jaundice. The abdomen is flat. There was no hepatosplenomegaly, caput medusa or spider nevus. Laboratory val values reveal a hematocrit of 40%. Liver function tests are normal. INR and PTT are both are normal. But the BUN to creation, uh, creatinine ratio is 1 is to th uh, 36. So with these clinical findings, the patient presented with hematemesis. There was no history of retching. The, bl the blood was very bright red in color. After this uh, episode, the patient feels slightly dizzy. There was no history of alcohol abuse. But there was history of intermittent epigastric pain, which was relieved by taking oral antacid pill. Previously, the patient had some injury over the knee for which he was taking ibuprofen daily. So on examination, the blood pressure is slightly low. That is, uh, uh, he is almost hypotensive because the diastolic is only 60 and the heart rate is 110. So he is having considerable amount of bleeding. And there are no signs of jaundice. Abdomen is flat. There is no hepatomegaly, caput medusa, spider nevus, which indicates liver problem. So laboratory value shows hematocrit of 40 and the blood coagulation profile is normal but the bun to creatinine ratio is 36. So with all these clinical findings, the diagnosis is the patient is having a bleeding peptic ulcer. So what are the predisposing factors or etiology for bleeding peptic ulcer? It is hyperacidity, H. pylori infection and use of NSIs. These three are the important triads for developing peptic ulcer. Burns and head trauma can produce stress ulcers, namely <coughs> curling and pushing ulcers respectively. Other ca uncommon causes are chronic pulmonary disease, cirrhosis, drugs like glucocorticoids and biphosphonate, ethanol and anticoagulant. So coming to the investigation, the first thing is you, sh you should do the lab investigation. You must do the CBC, platelet count and the differential count. CBC, you have to check every fourth, fourth hourly or every 
fixed hourly during the first day. You have to watch whether the hemoglobin is, uh, I mean, static or whether it is unstable. So you have to cross match and uh, type and cross match for at least for two to six units based on the rate of active bleeding. If the uh, if patient is having unstable hemoglobin, that signify ongoing hemorrhage requiring further in intervention. So you must also do the bun to creatinine ratio. Usually this will increase with upper gastrointestinal bleeding. The normal ratio should be within 1 is to 30. If the ratio is increased, that is 1 is to 36, with, with, in a patient who is not having any renal I mean insufficiency, that is suggestive of upper GI bleed. You must also look for PT, PTT and INR to rule out any uh, coagulopathy. If fibrinogen level is less than 100 mg per DL, that indicates advanced liver disease. So then the next thing is you have to insert a NG tube, aspirate and look for the nature or the color of the aspirate. If the aspirate is fresh blood or coffee ground aspirate, bleeding may be from stomach, esophagus or sometimes it may be from duodenum also. If the aspirate is clear, that means there is no bleeding up to the pyloric sphincter. Still, this patient can have bleeding from duodenum, but you, you can exclude bleeding anywhere from, from the mouth up to the pyloric sphincter. If the aspirate is bile, then there is no bleeding even in the duodenum. So you can say there is no bleeding from the mouth up to the DJ flexure. In other words, there is no upper GI bleed if you are aspirating bile. But however, this, this test is not 100% reliable. So you must do a upper GI endoscope to confirm your diagnosis to find out from where the patient is bleeding. Here in this picture, you are seeing a sputter, spurter, spurting artery from the duodenal side for which they did a hemoclip. So suppose if you are not able to find out the site of the bleeding or the source of the bleeding by doing an endoscopy, the, uh, after that you must, you can try a <coughs> angiogram, especially if the bleeding is very brisk. That means at least the bleeding should be at least 0.5 to 1 ml per minute. Then only you can do this angiography. The advantages are there is no need for any bowel preparation. Accurate localization of rapidly bleeding lesion is possible. Immediate hemostasis also you can do because this is not only diagnostic, this is therapeutic also. You can inject some, uh, I mean, uh, that is called uh, th uh, therapeutic embolization. You can do it through the angiogram. It is limited to only those patients who are having continuous bleeding. Then only you can do this, this uh, procedure. So the complications are arterial thrombosis. There may be uh, reactions to the contract or sometimes these patients may go for acute renal failure. Suppose if angiogram also is not responding because the patient uh, with massive hemorrhage in, in whom a bleeding source is not identified, then you can go for what is called the technetium sulfur colloid, uh, technetium 99, which is uh, tagged with RBC. This is called tagged red blood cell scintigraphy. So you can detect bleeding as low as only 0 0.1 ml per minute you can you can pick up by doing this uh, RBC tag scintigraphy. High variable accuracy rates for localizing the bleeding ranging from 24 to 91% of these bleedings you can localize. But the patient should have active bleeding, then only you can pick up. It should bleeding should be at least 0.1 ml per minute. This radionuclide screening appears to increase the diagnostic yield of arteriography by 2.4. So advantages are this is very safe, safe this is non-invasive uh, and it is cost also is very low. Disadvantage is you, it is only a diagnostic uh, procedure. You cannot do any uh, therapy using this procedure. The surgical therapy should, you should not recommend surgical therapy on basis of the result of this take RBC scintigraphy alone. 
So now this is the risk stratification. There are three risk stratifications are there. Number one is the forest classification. You can see that this this is three grades. The grade one A usually will be having an arterial sputter. The risk of rebleeding is hundred percent, and these patients need uh, endoscopic treatment. One B usually there will be active oozing from the ulcer. The risk of rebleeding is fifty-five percent. These patients also need endoscopic therapy. Two A usually there will be protuberant vessel over the over the uh, ulcer. The risk of rebleeding is forty-three percent. These patients also need endoscopic treatment. The two B there will be adherent blood clot. This is adherent blood clot. The risk of rebleeding is twenty-two percent. These patients also need endoscopic therapy. Two C the uh, in the ulcer bed you can see some pigmented spot the chance of rebleeding is very less it is only 10% there is no need for any endoscopic treatment and now uh, grade 3 usually will be having clean ulcer base clean ulcer base you can see it the chance of rebleeding is only 5% and endoscopic treatment is not necessary for these patients so the other scoring is rockel scoring There are some variables like age, comorbidity, shock, source of bleeding, and segment of recent bleeding are there. So in the first three, the age, comorbidity, and shock are clinical variables. Whereas the source of bleeding and segment of re recent bleeding, you can you can uh, come to know only after doing endoscopy. So without endoscopy, you you cannot do Rockel scoring. So if the score is You have to do all these things, and then you have to give the score to your patient. If the score is less than three, that means the chance of re-bleeding is very less, and patient is having a very good prognosis. If score is more than eight, risk of re-bleeding is more, more, and even risk of death is there. The another, uh, I mean, the scoring system is Gla Glasgow Blatchford bleeding score. So here also there are. variables like blood urea nitrogen hemoglobin systolic blood pressure and some miscellaneous markers like the pulse rate more than 100 per minute presentation with melina presentation with syncope hepatic disease presence of hepatic disease and presence of cardiac failure so all these parameters are only clinical parameters there is no need to do endoscopy in these patients so then you have to interpret this score so if the score is below 0 that means low risk for any intervention you need not do any intervention these patients can be successfully managed as outpatient outpatient uh, procedure so you need not admit these patients if score is more than 0 increase the risk for intervention and these patients need inpatient management however if the score is less than 5 usually these patients will respond without any significant intervention suppose if the score is more than 5 these patients are uh, th these patients need intervention maybe blood transfusion endoscopic intervention or even surgical intervention so coming to the bleeding peptic ulcer to begin with you have to treat with drugs so the most common is the proton pump inhibitor this is a potent acid suppressive drug so the mechanism is this ppi binds irre irreversibly to a hydrogen potassium atpase enzyme that is the proton pump on the gastric parietal cells and blocks the secretion of hydrogen ions into the stomach so because of the low acidity this improve the ulcer healing in less acidic environment advantages this will decrease the bleeding re bleeding and even for indication for surgery side effect if you are uh, using it for a long term patient may have loose stools abdominal pain muscle and joint pain leukopenia hepatic dysfunction or atrophic gastritis you can also use h2 antagonist also you can use the most common is the ranitidine the side effect is gi side effects tns effect bolus iv injection cause release of histamine nitrates also you can use or you can use the somatostatin or 
the somatostatin analog that is actrotide but normally actrotide we use only for uh, very cell hemorrhage or if you don't know the source of the hemorrhage it is better to use antifibrinolytic therapy the commonest is the tranexamic acid then coming to the endoscopic therapy suppose you are not able to control the bleeding by drugs alone you have to uh, i mean you have to do the endoscopic therapy there are three modalities one is you can give injections you can use some thermal appliances or you can put some mechanical appliances no single modality has been <coughs> shown to be superior than the other modality this depends on the operator experience so repeat endoscopy there is clinical evidence of active re bleeding that is grade c if there are concerns regarding optimal initial endoscopic therapy then then also you can repeat endoscopy <coughs> so coming to the endoscopic therapy injections you can use adrenally you can use the fibrin glue or tissue glue you can use human thrombin use the n butyl 2 cyanoacrylate the sclerosens or sodium tetradecal sulfate sodium morvid ethanolamine oleate and absolute alcohol <coughs> the thermal methods or you can use heat heater probe bicap probe the gold probe this is gold probe or argon plasma coagulator this is the <coughs> argon plasma coagulator or you can e even use endiog laser therapy mechanical you can apply a hemoclip to the bleeding uh, spurting blood vessel you can use a banding also you can use the endo loops sometimes even you can use a stapler or even open suture also you can do so here you are seeing a bleeding gastric ulcer they have applied a hemoclip to stop the bleeding so if the endoscopic treatment fail then you can go for angiographic therapy indication severe persistent bleeding with endoscopy either unsuccessful or unavailable and surgery is also very risky so you have to do what is called super selective angiographic approach you can use vasopressin through intra arterial route this will stop bleeding in 20 to 80% of patient but the problem is you shouldn't use vasopressin in those patients who are having coronary artery disease and those who are having ischemic bowel disease because this vasopressin will contract Uh, both the uh, bowel, uh, the, both the mesenteric, I mean arteries as well as the coronary arteries. You can the same, uh, uh, I mean the artery. You can use some uh, e embolic uh, materials like this is called therapeutic embolism. You can use a gel foam, tissue adhesive beads, or even clips to stop bleeding. So bleeding is severe. What is what are the indications for surgery? If nothing. is uh, i mean uh, the if the patient is not responding for all the above mentioned procedure then the finally you have to resort to surgical intervention if the bleeding is severe and uncontrolled it it occurs in 5 to uh, 10% of the uh, patients the indications for surgery are hemodynamic instability despite vigorous resuscitation that is more than 6 units blood transfusion already failure of endoscopic techniques recurrent hemorrhage after initial stabilization shock associated with recurrent hemorrhage continued slow bleeding with a transfusion requirement exceeding 3 units per day these are all indications for surgery so the, the here you are seeing different types of gastric ulcer the type 1 is you are seeing over the almost near the incisura angularis you are seeing the ulcer in type 2 you are seeing one ulcer in the near the incisura angularis and another duodenal ulcer in type 3 you are seeing a pre pyloric ulcer in type 4 you are seeing ulcer almost near the g junction so what is the treatment in type 1 ulcer you can do either just ulcer excision and closure or ulcer can be biopsied and overso overso or you can even go for partial gastrectomy in type 2 and type 3 bleeding ulcer you can here also you can do excision with primary closure or you can do distal gastrectomy <coughs> or gastric ulcer excision with vagotomy and pyloroplastomy 
phyloroplasty. All these things you can do. In post-operative patients should have H. pylori infection eradication. That is H. pylori eradication to avoid and use, the patient should also avoid use of NSAIDs. So this is the algorithm for bleeding peptic ulcer, the upper GI hemorrhage. Okay, it is ma majority, it is peptic ulcer disease or uh, those patients having NSAIDs, those who are consuming alcohol, okay, they will be vomiting, liver disease in case of vericial, uh, I mean vericial hemorrhage, trauma, history of trauma, all these things you have to ask. Labs, you have to send L uh, CBC, liver function test, PT, PDT, platelets, type and uh, cross match. These patients, you have to reserve at least 2 to 6 points depending upon the severity. So, the first thing is you have to resuscitate the patient after doing the ABC. Stabilize the patient first. Put the NGT, find out the, where the source is. You can start a two uh, peripheral, uh, uh, I mean white bore uh, uh, IV line. You can start and you can give IV fluids crystallized to begin with. If hemoglobin is very low, you can even give blood transfusion. You can uh, do gastric irrigation through the NG tube, but you should not use ice cold saline. You can use the normal body temperature uh, saline you can use to uh, wash this clot. So then uh, you, if ne there is a need, you can even intubate this patient. Prepare the patient for endoscopy within the first uh, 12 hours. Do endoscopy, then you can find out the source of the bleeding. If it is bleeding from esophageal varices, I have discussed in the previous uh, video itself. If the bleeding is from gastroduodenal source, you can uh, try endoscopic hemostasis. If the bleeding control, then you have to continue the uh, H. pylori er eradication and the medical therapy using PPI. So, if the bleeding is not controlled and if it is gastric ulcer, you can just excise it, do biopsy or you can even do partial gastrectomy. If the patient is having gastro uh, esophagogastric ulcer, ligate the vessel and sometimes you can even do vagotomy with pyloroplasty. If it is duodenal ulcer, you can, you can do vagotomy and antrectomy. So coming to the special varieties of ulcer, this is dialophilation. Dialophilation is, this is a, uh, a type of angiodysplasia where you will see a single arteriole you will be seeing just beneath the uh, mucosa. So, this is location is most common in stomach only, but it can occur in esophagus as well as in duodenum. Bleeding is massive and it is recurrent. Endoscopically, you can treat it with uh, organ plasma coagulator or you can put banding or you can apply hemoclips. Surgery, what is the need for? You can, uh, surgery also you can do, you can do a gastrostomy with you can, uh, you can actually, you can sue this, I mean, uh, you can suture these bleeding vessels or you can, if the bleeding is not, uh, you, you, if you are not able to know the uh, bleeding site, then you can go for partial gastrectomy. Mallory vas tear, it is a submucosal, it is a mucosal and submucosal tear uh, because of uh, severe vomiting or retching. Diagnosis is based upon the history of vomiting or retching and it should be confirmed by endoscopy. It is very important to perform the J maneuver or retroflexion maneuver, then only you will be able to see this, this tear. Most of these tear occur along the lesser curvature. Supportive therapy in 90%. So, endoscopic therapy like injection or electrocoagulation also you can do. Supportive therapy is mainly PPI and you can use sucralfate. Surgery is very rarely there is, uh, there is an indication for surgery in these patients. You have to do just gastrotomy, gastrostomy and then you have to uh, suture this mucosal tear. Then the gastric erosion is uh, common after consuming uh, NSAIDs or it may be stress related both the curling ulcer and pushing ulcer or consumption after consumption of alcohol. So these are the common causes for gastric multiple gastric erosions. So, uh, you have, it can be treated by the acid suppressive therapy that is PPI, proton pump inhibitor you can use. You can endoscopically, you can try to control this bleeding or angiography, you can in infuse vasopressin or even 
acrotyle or you can try therapeutic embolization also. Surgery is rarely indicated. If, if there is a need for surgery, you can go for vagotomy and pyloroplasty with over sewing of this hemorrhagic area. Or sometimes even near total gastrectomy also you can do. But if you are doing surgery, the mortality is very high, it's 60%. So, esophagitis, the various causes are GOD, infection, medication, Crohn's disease and radiation. So, the, uh, it, it can also cause occult blood loss usually. The treatment is, uh, the, you can find it out by doing an endoscopy. This is uh, acid suppressive therapy you can do or endoscopic control, namely the electrocoagulation or ketoprobe you can use. Operation is seldom necessary. Geodinitis is a very rare cause for acute blood. Risk factors or severe erosive duodenitis are similar to those patients with bleeding peptic ulcer. Those are NSAIDs, H. pylori and anticoagulation therapy. Bleeding is usually self-limited and rarely requires any intervention. So malignancy, okay, it may be esophageal malignancy or it may be uh, stomach malignancy. The most common is esophageal malignancy. Endoscopic therapy often successful in controlling hemorrhage, but re-bleeding rate is very high. Therefore, surgical, because this is malignancy, surgical treatment is important in these cases. So, the another interesting, uh, I mean, uh, rare cause is gastric antral vascular ecthesia. This affects middle-aged elderly female with achlorhydria, atrophic gastritis and cirrhosis. This is characterized by aggregates of ec ecstatic vessels that appears red spot of gastric mucosa. This will be arranged in linear pattern in the antrum of the stomach resembling a watermelon. That is why it is called watermelon appearance. You can uh, do endoscopic therapy uh, like uh, organ plasma coagulator you can do and you can try to electrocoagulate these areas. If these endoscopic treatment fails, you can even do antrectomy. So, the another thing is aortoendric fistula. Those patients who underwent surgery for abdominal aortic aneurysm, they, they, they may develop a pseudo aneurysm and subsequent fistulization between this graft and the underlying <coughs> aorta. So, hemorrhage will be very massive and it is fatal. So, you can uh, identify by doing CT scan with IV contrast where you can see air around the graph, possible pseudo aneurysm, rarely IV contrast in duodenal lumen. Treatment is ligation of iota proximal to the uh, graph, removal of the infected processes and extra anatomical bypass. So another thing is hemobilia. This is blood in the biliary tract, typically associated with trauma or recent instrumentation of the biliary tree or hepatic neoplasm. This is associated with Quinkey's triad, that is presence of hematemesis or presence of melina, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. Endoscopy is helpful by demonstrating blood at the ampulla. Angiography is a diagnostic procedure of choice. You can also try angiographic embolization to stop this bleeding. So another thing is hemosuccus pancreaticus. This is caused by erosion of pancreatic pseudocyst into the splenic artery. Patient, with, a patient will present with abdominal pain, blood loss and a past history of pancreatitis. Angiography is diagnostic and this also permits therapeutic embolization to stop the bleeding. In cases that are not amenable, uh, you, that are amenable, you can even do distal pancreatectomy to stop this bleeding. So these are, uh, the, this is a tabular column, this you can use as a ready reckoner to uh, confirm, I mean to confirm your uh, difference, the, your diagnosis, possible diagnosis. So uh, I have given uh, several uh, differential diagnosis, as I, as I told you in the previous video, you have to do the vertical reading to rule out your diagnosis from all other diagnostic possibilities. So thank you very much for watching my video. If you think that these videos are very useful, 
I request you to share with your friend. Kindly subscribe to get notified regarding my latest upload. Thank you once again for watching this video. Let us meet in an at another episode. Until then, bye bye.